Ah, looks like it's recording. Ah, uh, looks like it anyway. Who knows for sure? Um, anyway, well, I guess I can check for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's really wintry here. Cold, cold, cold. Um, horrible. Awful. Cold. Um, I mean, you know, we've been lucky so far, but it's just, yeah, you know, it's good. My pipes froze last night. Oh, it's you know, hassle. Um, anyway. Um, uh, not the pipes, all of them, but just the water line coming into the house. And so, you know, I have to go outside and pour water on it and go through all that crap. And, uh, that's not much more fun. The dog prints here. Good. Some dogs. Anyway, um, video. I think I'll make one. Just thought the, the general subject of uh, the value of psychological ambition, I guess, might be a good general subject. But it seems to be the sticking point or the hanging point. It's not that a hanging point or something for a hospital day. You know, he's just not... He's not getting the fundamental value argument um, because he's not appreciating that... Yeah, it doesn't really matter what makes you happy. Just as it doesn't matter who's happy, it doesn't matter what makes them happy. And it's kind of a sad truth, but it's sort of the truth. So, in a sense, um, we're sort of back to this argument that, uh, you know, the human race would be better off uh, so retarded, you know, stupid, that, uh, you know, if it's not going to do anything magnificent with its existence, uh, it might as well just be an imbecile and enjoy eating its own poo um, and call that living. And although that would be, from our perspective, an indignity, <laughs> you know, that's only because we have a sense that we do have some, um, that we have risen to some standard where we're entitled to something better than that. Uh, but clearly, I think the argument could be made that we have, uh, you know, pooed in our pants, essentially. We have squandered and wasted our intelligence in a, you know, quite an embarrassing way. I mean, greenhouse, uh, you know, a preposterous debt, liability to the future. I mean, these are not, <laughs> these aren't. These aren't unretarded acts. These are the acts of a retard. Um, so anyway, so the, my point is, is that, yeah, you have this basic value component that he's just not, he's not recognizing the argument as it's stated, and instead just keeps trying to turn into some other argument. The argument is value is made when a sensitive creature has a sensitive feeling, has a feeling. That's it. Uh, you could argue that there's a, a goodness to the good feelings and a badness to the bad feelings. And then we're going to figure out what the ness part is. Um, again, the, you know, the Benatar argument is, and my argument is, is that the good is kind of made out of a pre-existing negative being corrected that you're just correcting for your hunger. You're not correcting for some, like, oh, I was in bliss and I went to double bliss. <laughs> you know, so um, we're just fooled by our psychology into thinking that not existing means being unsatisfied and tormented by it. And it doesn't mean that. Just as people think death is dying and they're not the same thing. Um, being dead is not the process of dying. So, yeah, you have to parse all this stuff correctly. Uh, you can't call those two things the same thing. Uh, that would be a... It would be a rather dramatic error, right? Somebody would say, oh, well, that's a... You know, that's not so obvious. If you made the error of confusing dying with being dead. Those two things aren't uh, comparable. Uh, I mean, are comparable. Uh, 
And that's sort of what Hoffler is doing here, is he's attempting to force something like the idea of a value kernel being a comfort state. And he's trying to force that to be an active state of a specific kind of comfort, a specific kind of uh, fulfillment or gratification. And it's, it's not appropriate. It's like the difference between being dead and dying. They're not the same thing. They're related, they're part of, but they're not really anything like each other. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's part of this semantics problem, if you want to say there is one, our communication problem. Um, I'm still going to argue that I think it's a deliberate evasion uh, of the fundamental premise that's inescapable, and that is a sentient demands attention. If there was just an intelligence in the universe, and it was an honorable intelligence, that is, it tried to do the right thing, uh, and had no distracting, selfish, personal agenda, besides just saying, I'm going to do the right thing, and that's all it did, it fed on that, and that alone. Uh, and a sentient creature was popped into existence before it, it would find it uh, quite uh, uh, distracting. It would, it would occupy its time uh, trying to figure out what the sentient needed to feel good, because it would know good is going to be what that thing needs. Oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, I am not going across here. No, no, it's not happening. <sighs> yeah. And such. Uh, I just kind of, I don't know why I kind of figured, oh, there'll be a place to get across somehow magically. <laughs> no, it's all kind of half frozen. Not entirely frozen. So... I may have just gone for a walk in the cold, for which there will be no productive conclusion. Because I don't see. <laughs> yeah, now I'm going to get across here. I wish one of these trees is a nice leaner there. I wish that baby would fall. That would be a good. See, it's right in a wide space in the stream, though. That's the only downside. It's such a wide part of the stream that it might end up half underwater. But yeah, so I used to have trees. And, uh, for years, there's always trees. <laughs> you know, I could walk across. And, uh, you know, we all had all those big hurricanes and they washed all my trees away. stream hasn't acquired new ones yet. Yeah, it is kind of weird too, like when, when the ice forms, uh, it really does rise the water level. Which, uh, I don't know, I guess it creates some sort of friction, you know, for the water. Once I guess that friction builds up pressure and lag in the stream. And so the same amount of water is going through, but it's going through slower. So it ends up being uh, this. So, see, yeah, because if it wasn't as, you know, it's like, you know, falling into six inches of water is no big deal, but a foot and a half of water, you know, that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, that's, I don't want to do that. And to the further back I have to walk this way is the further I have to walk that way. Ooh, there is a little tree across the stream. I don't know if I it's kind of a small one. It's gonna be kind of dicey crossing on that thing. I don't know. I think that was there last year and I said, no, that ain't gonna happen. 
Maybe I should nail boards on it. <laughs> yeah. It's funny how the animals are using it. It's covered with the animal prints. A fox. There's a fox that's going across there. A little clever bastard. So I guess I could see how hard this ice is. And attempt a full body slide thing. <sighs> Shit, I don't like doing that either. So you never know about the middle. It's always the middle that's the problem. I don't like falling into it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is kind of a good area right here. This is where I went across last year. But, tell me, you know, this ice isn't all that old. I just don't know if it's thick enough. It's only like two days of hard freezing. I mean, you know, really, really cold. <sighs> Looks pretty thick, though. Oh, yeah. rock. Anyway, so I'm sorry for the distraction. I suppose we'll need all this stable on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, stream crossing dynamics. This is sort of a specialty subject. All right, get some altitude on this. Oh shit, not far enough. Yeah, it didn't go through, but I wanted it a little further. <laughs> it's kind of a stupid idea. Yeah, let's see if I can break the ice and then I'll cross it after I break it. I really probably can scoot across, but yeah. Maybe, I got an idea, I think. There is ice where that tree is. So, I'll just hold on to the tree. And all I have to do is get across the soft spots. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll see how that works. Alright, so I'll put the camera away. Tidy up here. So I'll see you on the other side, maybe. Yeah. Pretty. Sort pretty. Alright, putting my glove back on. Um, so yeah, it worked ooh, quite well. So, <laughs> it's a good idea. Oh, fuck. I hate these gloves. You know, I guess it's nice to have a plastic at the end. You know, keep the, the wind out, but, you know, elastic makes it good. Uh, Difficult to get them on. They're really not doing the job. <laughs> you know, I, said, the, I said, well, the, whatever. The, now we're going to do a bunch of glove videos. You know, but I do have the knit gloves. And uh, sometimes they don't seem to quite do the job. And uh, it is funny how, you know, modern versus old style. And, uh, you know, they both sort of fail. <coughs> so anyway. So, but lots of extra videos to make, time to make here. <laughs> extra walking. Um, so, you know, wrecked tree. See, that would be nice if that would wreck across the street. Well, I've already said that, so. It's going to be a long day. <laughs> it's already looking like it's running out of day. And I'm cold already. Should have brought a real scarf. It's my fake one isn't really working. Whatever that is. My ears are cold. Anyway, enough of that complaining shit. I'm just cold. Ugh, trees are creaking. I guess I gotta pull my hat over the ear. It's not really a hat. <laughs> a leg from a pair of sweatpants. It works. Um, you might have to use everything up. Uh, 
Alright, sorry, I'm probably way off the subject now. Shadow day. Anyway, um, so the game, the game, I don't really want to talk about the game. Uh, so our psychology just wants stuff. Different people want different things. But I think if you really think about it, uh, it doesn't really matter what they want. It does matter how they perform in life. So. There certainly is a difference between somebody wanting, uh, you know, just to um, shag women versus cure cancer. I mean, obviously, people who have ambitions that are related to uh, something productive in society are likely to be more productive in their overall effect on the world. And so you'd call that... Uh, having greater ethical potential um, and uh, but the point is is the gratification we individually feel is it doesn't really matter how it's derived it just matters that we feel it uh, and as much as like I said people can think it matters uh, whether you're admiring a crayon drawing or the Mona Lisa, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, the quality <laughs> of the experience can only be stated in the terms of, well, did you make more people happy with what you did? Did your, did the thing that makes you happy make other people happy? Or uh, rescue other sentient beings from some negative condition. And so again, that's really all you're doing when you're creating some kind of list, is you're just restoring you <laughs> to the state you would have been in if you didn't have some kind of uh, dissatisfaction, some sort of irritation, some sort of discomfort. The dis has to come first. Uh, you know, before you do the uh, acquisition of the uh, thing, the, the value experience. Uh, so, let's see, how else can it be stated so it's understood? So, again, Hathleday keeps insinuating, if not directly stating, that uh, he claims it to be not a rational uh, observation to observe that the organism is basically just a comfort machine. It produces a, a, a state of comfort, a level. And, uh, and that ethics is just about the calculation of comfort where you don't just count your own comfort, you count your effect on all the other comfort machines, uh, present and future. Uh, that's what you attempt to do. Now, quite obviously, for many human experiences, there would be no way to calculate all of those permutations exactly into the future. So you just have to use logical approximations and generalizations, which I would argue are perfectly valid. You certainly know that there's a very low probability that rolling dioxin into the Great Lakes, <laughs> you know, is going to be uh, good for mankind or animal kind, uh, and you can assume that uh, you know creating some kind of pain reliever would be good. Um, I think they're kind of safe general assumptions. Uh, I don't even know if assumption's the right word. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, they're generalizations more than assumptions. But anyway, 
I don't know if this will work. <laughs> the microphone's probably getting blocked. Uh, my hand goes cold. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. There's any other way to say this to make it uh, understood. So it's just as simple, like I said, there's nothing arbitrary in recognizing for myself that uh, suffering is very important. Feeling good is very important. Uh, I'm just, and then just extending that idea to all these other organisms. It's also, if I'm going to be fair, I'm going to have to admit that my standards, my tastes, uh, in terms of my personal sensibilities, the things that get me off, are purely subjective, uh, and that they have no intrinsic or fundamental integrity as uh, ways to be happy, and uh, that theoretically, like I stated, all ways to be happy, all methods of happiness uh, are equal, except when you measure them based on their effect on the general population of sentient beings. That's the only thing that makes them unequal, is whether they make more sentient beings happy or not. So ironically, the thing we should be dumping <laughs> into the Great Lakes is probably lead paint. Uh, make everybody super dumb so they won't be able to opine on how futile and stupid their existence is. But super dumbness will create more suffering uh, in the long run. So the good news is we don't have to become super dumb because even though we will be more blissful, generally speaking, in terms of our ease of comforting, you know, be made happy by pink balloons, we won't have to land on the moon. <laughs> we won't have to do anything very ambitious. Uh, the truth is, the stupidity will uh, make us uh, insufferably suffer. <laughs> and uh, so therefore, we won't uh, benefit from our ease of comfort because we will be causing so much discomfort through our stupidity. So, I don't know if there's too many more ways to try to describe this, but those are the subjective elements. So that's another, I suppose, ironic part of this conversation, our irritating part, is that in my opinion, Hoffa Day has completely got it backwards. He thinks the subjective elements of our ambition, called agency, are the valuable things. <laughs> and he thinks the basic end result, whether you're happy or sad, is the non-valuable part. And uh, so it's just kind of an ironic circumstance that he's claiming uh, a subjective disqualification and um, claiming an, an objective qualification to something silly like ambition. You know, that it's somehow it's just because we have it, it's valuable. Uh, no. So anyway, that's enough. Yeah, sorry, it's a little bit of a, oops, see your hand right over the microphone. Well, it's okay. You can read lips or something. Um, <laughs> I ate it though. So, very good of me to endeavor to persevere my little lousy chores. Anything else? I feel like it took longer. I have to see how many minutes. Yeah, well, I had to take that longer route, so there's no point in doing that. Alright. Uh, the yard looks smaller in the snow. 
<laughs> yeah, it's funny how it's, it's a little more compacted. I guess it's a higher number of pixels per square inch or something. So, it just seems, yeah. So ice skating on the pool. Anyway, so till the next time and such. So forth and whatnot. Oh, I'm here, so I might as well, I might as well force you to be out here, too. Um, yeah, that's not, that's selfish, right? Yeah, yeah that was selfish. Um, so yeah, so it's just kind of a good word to talk and play with a little bit. The, uh, the nature, you know, what we need, you know, how we have to constantly, almost, um, placate our our subjective individuality. So this is sort of another argument that Hoffa Day isn't quite getting. That uh, there's a clear distinction, I think, between my feeling self and my thinking self. And that I can think, I can solve problems in all kinds of abstract ways, in all kinds of abstract space. Uh, I can play a uh, a video game, for example, and be immersed as if I was a, I could be a cube, or I could be a, a flake of snow, or you could be almost anything in these games, virtually, uh, and experience through you know, a, a vicarious kind of uh, experience as a thinking thing in defense of the cube, or in defense of the chick, or the wolf, or whatever your character is. So clearly we can extend our capacity to think to the interests of very different things than ourselves. Um, as an abstract capacity. And so if I say that my logic, my reasoning, the best of my intelligence is not the exclusive property of this body and that it in essence is playing the game, it's playing the big game, it's playing the, it's got to consider all the other players on the board. Now, I would argue that clearly, I don't think any individual would be capable of being that perfectly objective, where they could uh, really turn themselves into uh, a true equal with the competing, <laughs> you know, I said the word competing, even though we shouldn't be competing with each other, but the, the also interested, let's call, let's, call, call, let's call each other that, the also interested, um, the also needing, the also wanting, the also burdened, uh, yeah, so, uh, ideally, I would argue rationally, logically, my brain should just work for a best solution for everyone concerned. <laughs> yeah, okay. The thing that creates the, the best solution uh, for everyone concerned. Uh, I'll just say that in a better way. You know, because it does sort of turn into an averaging or it turns into a it's a very delicate thing because you could argue that sometimes the best interest is uh, for, for 9 out of 10 people would be to dump all the burden on one person, right? So that would be the most benefit to 9 out of 10. But clearly it would be so horrible for the one who got all the burden that that would be disqualified as a, uh, the best solution. The best solution probably isn't slavery. <laughs> There's probably better solutions uh, to the dilemma of, uh, you know, apportioning work to the masses uh, and uh, apportioning the uh, the bounty, the fruit of the labor. Uh, but there is a solution. There is a a right answer 
to these questions uh, in terms of um, recognizing that once you isolate those extreme uh, extreme trespasses against equity, let's call it. Trespasses against equity. I don't know if that's a real concept. I mean, it sounds like a nice bit of ethical reasoning. Trespass against equity. But, um, yeah, I don't know how you'd put it into a formula. You know, an explicit one. Uh, so again, we're sort of stuck with the extremes. Uh, it's really hard to see the stuff in the middle, but we can certainly see the stuff pretty clear on the extremes in terms of the things, systems that seem extremely uh, well balanced and things that seem extremely uh, imbalanced in terms of uh, the density and the proportionality of uh, suffering. Certainly you can see efficiency. I mean, you can you can see a, a something like a car. I've used this example many times. And it's fuel efficiency. You can certainly see uh, when something's, uh, you know, gaining, uh, you know, uh, when it's converting most of the energy into work rather than having it wasted as heat or friction or some other... Uh, negative component and so those are easy to see uh, whoa, that was almost not good <laughs> yeah. uh, my right leg is gonna kill me it's kind of funny I could a guy made that what my left foot movie I can make my my right foot movie <laughs> a movie about a guy who keeps tripping on shit and then eventually gets paralyzed because of his left, I mean his right foot. My right foot can paralyze me. It's a very nice, ironic movie. I'm liking it. I think I'll star in it. Uh, oh man, that's uh, I'm gonna have to crawl in the crawl space. Blah, blah, blah. Let's do it some point froze. <laughs> it's just one of those. That's uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just gonna complain a little. I think. <laughs> I think. Uh, I'm pretty certain I'm gonna complain a little. Oh, sorry. It's been a very difficult period. Just a dumping salt on the sewage plant road. So anyway, I think I'll end it here. But I do have to do all this complex traversing through the ice patches and the uh, sticks and the crud. So, I think I covered a good deal of important stuff and said some stuff in a new way maybe that will help, hopefully, and uh, make it clearer that uh, that really is, we're just, we're machines and we produce, you know, feel good, feel bad. That's the major thing we produce. And we, f we produce it not only in ourselves, but we cause it in others. And that's pretty much what we do. And uh, you're doing it well if you're making feel good, and you're doing it badly if you're making feel bad. <laughs> I mean, sometimes that isn't going to be your fault. Uh, you know, cancer and such. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact of the bad uh, being real. Where the hell am I? You know? I don't know. I gotta go ways yet. <laughs> I, I don't uh, I don't walk this side of the stream too often, so it's 
not too many visual signposts. Very rocky here. Gotta be careful. Fall down on this stuff, I'm really in trouble. I have to break something. Ah. I really shouldn't have to go this far up. This should be the picnic table. Ah, it is, except there's no picnic table. That's what's throwing me off. Here's my old swimming hole from the reverse side. Yeah, it really did very well for 30 years. But I tell you, it was cold swimming in that stream. <laughs> yeah, it was cold in there. Ah, uh, so anyway. But, kind of miss the old days. Tarzan days. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and so forth. And whatnot. Anyway, here we are. The crossing. So I will scoot across here and get home before my fingers freeze off. Oh, sweet. Got a saw cut in it. I hope somebody doesn't actually cut this down. <laughs> I need it. Anyway, until next time. Such. God, I'm going to fall in the water.